CSS podcast. Continuing from episode 79, our last episode on dialogue and popover, this episode is all about animating these elements to and from the top layer. We'll cover transitions and keyframe animations of the popover attribute and dialogue element, their backdrops, and give you the properties and at rules that you need to elegantly present and dismiss these components. Totally. At a high level, the terms we're going to be discussing are things like allow discrete, at starting dash style, overlay, and three selectors, colon modal, colon popover dash open, and colon colon backdrop. We'll dive into each of these, their relevance for animating dialogues and popovers. And after this quick commercial break, <laughs> just kidding, we don't have those here. <laughs> uh, but I mean, background on top layer. So let's do a little bit of a background on top layer in case people in the last episode uh, forgot it, or maybe it's been a couple of weeks and whatever. You're in your car, you're like, well, with top layer. Can you give it a little breakdown of what that was? Of course. So uh, again, as Adam mentioned, definitely recommend episode 79 if you want to hear a little bit more about the top layer and the elements that live inside of the top layer. But generally, you can think of the top layer as a special location for elements to be inserted into your UI that sits on top of the rest of the document. It's a sibling next to the body, but after it, so it's above it. And that means that the top layer is not in the flow of the rest of your document in the body and behaves sort of like a fixed viewport. And you can rely on everything inside of the top layer being on top of everything in the body element. So everything in the rest of your DOM. So you don't have to worry about Z index and you don't have to even worry about Z index 99999 in your regular DOM overriding or being above elements in your top layer. And this is kind of also how CSS layers work with specificity too. If it's another layer, so another layer on top of the previous one, it'll automatically um, win, if you will. So there's only one top layer, but you can have multiple elements in the top layer or multiple items in the top layer, which we'll talk about too, but you don't have multiple top layers. There's just one. So I talked a little bit about the top layer, but how do we now put things in the top layer, Adam? Yeah. And it's so funny as you were describing top layer, I'm like, it's totally the penthouse of the DOM, mm -hmm. which there's only one. Uh, is our penthouses, are there multiple? I've never been in a penthouse, so it's like, I don't know. Well, you could have an, a penthouse floor in an apartment complex, and then you could have like four penthouses up there, you know? Uh, okay. Well, this is, oh, well, I guess this is your penthouse floor, and you can have <laughs> multiple elements <laughs> yeah, in it. That's true. Uh, it's so funny. And it's like hey, Highlander. There can be only one. It's like a singleton. Anyway, okay. So how do we get things into this radical DOM penthouse called the top layer? For dialog, you call the show modal function on the element itself. Um, and for popover, you call popover.show. So those are two JavaScript ways to do it. Or you can use popover target attribute on an invoking button and point to the popover ID that you want to show and also specify something like popover target action to show. That way you can show something declaratively with HTML or you have a JavaScript option. And fun note, you can also hide a popover declarity, declaratively with popover target action. So just like you, you can specify that to show, you can also set that to hide. So anyway, it's just fun declarative ways to do that. And stuff that's been shown this way is colon modal. So we mentioned that pseudo class earlier. And uh, this is because the way that it works, we talked about modal in the previous episode, but modals also get a backdrop pseudo element, which is something that we can animate, right? You don't want to just animate the card that shows up in top layer. You want to fade in this whole backdrop. Maybe it blurs things and stuff like that. So once you get things in there, there's a new stacking context inside of it, but it's ordered as items are added. So that's why Yuno's is mentioning Z index. It totally doesn't really matter anymore. Uh, once you're in this top layer, the most recently items, uh, most recently added items are uh, added on top. It's kind of like a football dog pile, you know, like uh, <laughs> someone jumps in and then other people <laughs> jump on the ball and all of a sudden you got this dog pile or it's like you're discarding a card in a card game and, and you, you put it on top of the deck. So it's like the most recently played card goes on top type deal. Anyway, uh, this means if you want something on top, you might have to remove it and re-add it. So in case you are finding yourself in a competitive space in the top layer, you can just re-add it and all of a sudden it'll be on top. So that's the rules are kind of simple there. Uh, you can also find things in the top layer in DevTools, which is really, really rad. Uh, you can see the element node like deep in the tree pointing to the top layer once it's been shown there. And then there's a top layer specifically showing all the items in it. It's super good for revealing this otherwise mysterious DOM penthouse. Um, yeah, 
So that's the top layer and new elements that can live there. What are the elements that can go in there again? So there's a few, there's the dialogue element, uh, anything that has a popover attribute applied to it. So elements that make sense that have popover on them. And also possibly coming soon will be customizable selects, specifically the data list of options for the customizable select will also live in the top layer as it will leverage the powers of popover and anchor positioning. We don't even talk about anchor in this episode. I believe we're talking about it coming up, but that's that makes it even way more powerful to have elements that are stacked in these popover layers on, in the top layer, but have a uh, arrangement and placement with the rest of the DOM. It's very complex, very powerful. So cool. Yep. And it's also really nice that these elements and elements that have these properties on them, um, that they appear in the top layer because that means they can live anywhere in the DOM and still get shown in the top layer. So a pop-up or dialog can live alongside the component invoking it, but appear in the top layer when shown. And that also means that if you're building something in a component-based framework, you can import your list of say tooltips separately from the buttons that invoke them and then hook them up. And you don't have to order the DOM in a specific way, like having them be children or siblings. You don't have to have empty elements in the body as placeholders for when you want that stuff to be on top, like with portals. So the way that we invoke these things is actually super flexible and provides a lot of options for developers. Gotta love that co-location, you know, like here's my component, here's a dependency it has on showing something to the user and I get to put them all together in the same file and not even worry about Z index stacking contexts. These things automatically can be put in that top layer. Right. So if you're Wikipedia and you have these popovers when you hover over uh, your, uh, say, anchor links, you could send those and the data that goes into those popovers as a separate component that runs through a list of data and put that at the end of your page like, or as a separate component when you're importing it. And that could be aside from the rest of the content and the text. And then you could hook up those links to those popovers. You don't have to have a popover next to a link every single time you want to see it when you invoke it. So it's just like a really nice system that gives you flexibility. You can put it next to it if you want, but you don't have to. Yep. Very good. I like flexibility. Okay. So that was kind of a background, right? Of like, uh, dialogues and popovers, how to put things into the top layer, stuff like that. It's a little bit of a review. And now is the juicy part of the episode where we're going to talk about controlling and animating the top layer. Put like, how do things go in? How do things come out? How do we control these things? And very specifically, it's going to be transition focus, not keyframe focus. So this is where things kind of get a little bit complex, but again, flexibility and you have options. So you can transition elements in and out of top layer. Um, well, and you can use keyframes. It's kind of an escape hatch, but they're a little bit more rigid than transitions. That's why we're going to focus on transitions because this is where we got a, a lot of new special powers added to CSS just to achieve these particular things. And you'll notice as we go through these, we'll be a little honest, some of it's kind of funky. It's a little new. So hang with us as we describe these things. But the reason for them being kind of funky is that this is a new combination of properties. It's because dialogues and popovers toggle the display property when they get shown and hidden, you know, between none and block. And that's not something that you can easily animate. They're also going into a new layer called a top layer. And they're also being taken in and out of there, like appended and removed. So those are why there's like a complex set of things here. Uh, and we'll cover it all for you. But let's start with the first one uh, that's new. What do we got? Yeah, so first let's talk about transition behavior. And this is a new property that allows for control when you're animating discrete animations, like discrete properties. And this is things like display, visibility, and overlay. Um, it's also things like blend modes or other values that don't interpolate between two states. So let's say you write something like transition display one second ease. Right now, without transition behavior, that won't animate anything because this display property is discrete. There's no in-between states from display block and display none. It's not like a color. It's not a numeric value. So the browser doesn't know what to do in between one state and another. A discrete property is exactly this. It is a transition that flips immediately. So the whole concept of one second and 
easing for ease is completely lost on this transition. So we would get that immediate change of the display property and then the transition. And I ran into this when I built CSS Gram, which is a sort of little library for styling uh, UI elements that recreates Instagram filters. And I was using blend modes a lot in filters. The filters would transition because the filters were not discrete animations. They had values, they had hue, they had uh, brightness values, and there was some kind of meaning between one value and another. With things like blend modes, like mixed blend mode or background blend mode, it was just on or off or the type of blend mode. So you can kind of fake it, but it was like you saw a clear shift. So now there's this property called transition behavior. And when we add transition behavior, we actually change how the browser transitions these values. So if you used transition behavior and you set transition behavior allow discrete, and you also want to make sure this value is underneath the transition shorthand if you wanted to apply the full transition because it could also be placed in the shorthand. So you can write this same thing as transition display one second ease and then allow dash discrete in the shorthand. So you can do it either way where you set all of your transition behavior, um, just like transition duration um, in your element. So you need to make sure that's after the uh, rest of the transition, or you can do it in line after every single discrete property that gets transitioned. So now the transition will wait for the, for now the transition, now the browser will wait for the transition to complete, to flip to the display from um, hidden to block or however you're animating so that you can actually see something moving in that timeline is coordinated with other transitions. It's important to note too, that display and visibility act a little differently than other discrete animations like blend modes, where discrete animations like blend modes will fi flip at that 50% point when you have allowed discrete on. So they become a part of the animation or transition at the 50% mark instead of immediately, where something like display will wait for the rest of the transitions. You're usually using this with opacity or something else to transition it before it fully goes um, display none from display block or something like that. Yeah, nice. Okay, so normally if you try to like transition display, it just does it immediately. And that's kind of why I like to think of allow discrete as sort of like deferred flipping. Um, we're, we're not changing the flipping behavior of of discrete properties in a transition, we're just making it wait until a certain amount of time has gone by. We're, we're making that time relevant to that transition, whereas it normally threw it away, like you were describing earlier. Okay, so that's exciting, maybe? I don't know, so instead of it <laughs> flipping right away, it waits a little bit, so like, wh why is this important though? It, it is kind of funny, like you now have to think about the type of thing you're transitioning, but it's important because, yeah, these things aren't straightforward. Right? So imagine that you're trying to transition out a dialogue. You want it to fade out before it becomes display none. So with transition behavior, you can match the exact timing of when the opacity animation completes to when display none is set. Uh -huh. And previously you couldn't do this. Like you'd have to use animations with keyframes or something. Um, or use JavaScript to do this. But now you don't have to worry about that anymore and you can just use transitions, which are a lot more straightforward. So whether you're transitioning an element in or out and there's a display or visibility style change to be transitioned, transition behavior allowed discrete is smart enough to change the property at the right time. So either setting it right away so it can fade in or setting it to display none after the opacity has gone to zero to fade it out. Cool. Okay. So like a keyframe version of this, which I, you know, like 0%, it would set display to block. And then I would animate from, you know, zero to 99%. And then at 90, at a hundred percent, I'd change display again. So that's like, if I wanted to hand manage discrete properties flipping, I'd have to write these kind of awkward keyframes, but transitioning is nice because I can interrupt to these things and, and then I don't have to write these weird keyframes. Okay. So that's pretty cool. I like enabling transitions to be uh, like on an equal playing field as keyframes. Like I, I want transitions more because it's so nice that transitions can be interrupted. You know, you could catch one of these halfway, a dialogue halfway disappearing and you're like, no, no, come back. And it would slide back up elegantly without any visual snapping, you know, like keyframes would do. Keyframes would like reset the entire animation and play it from the beginning to the end and transitions, they can be interrupted, which is really cool. Okay, so let's talk more about the syntax of transition behavior. You mentioned it a little bit here, but you can either put this in the transition shorthand or use the longhand transition behavior. 
And if you put it in the shorthand, it works like other transition properties. You can put a comma separated list of things you want to transition. And at the end of one of those definitions, you can say allow discrete. So this be like, you know, change opacity 0.3 seconds ease allow discrete. Or in this case, that's not that meaningful. So we'd say display one second ease allow discrete. So now it's you're specifying in that shorthand or you could use the longhand. And really the hot tip, like you mentioned earlier, is you might want to go with the longhand because A, you could set it once and set it for all of the transition properties, which might be good. Um, or you can make sure that it doesn't get overwritten by the shorthand because that shorthand will set defaults that don't include allow discrete. So make sure you're kind of managing those appropriately. You know, has a really great demo in her article called four new CSS features for smooth entry and exit animations, where she clicks a delete icon on a card, super classic. The goal is to fade it out and then remove it, which is pretty typical of a delete action and transition behavior allow discrete is used to remove the JavaScript code that was otherwise used to manage that just so that when it changes out to opacity zero, it then gets to set to display none and it's good stuff. You get to co-locate the sort of management of the display property and the transitioning properties all in one spot. Pretty cool stuff. Yes. Um, another thing to note too, like when we talk about applying this everywhere, is this does not work if you're trying to apply this as a global, like on the um, star selector, because of the specificity of the shorthand for the transition versus the transition behavior allowed discrete. So if you're thinking, oh, I can just apply this to my entire page by putting transition behavior allowed discrete on the star selector, it will get overridden by the shorthand of transition because of specificity because it's later on. Usually yeah, you're using resolution. classes or other things. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, cascade resolution as well. So just kind of keep that in mind. I know that um, it might be a first thought that you have of, oh, I want all of my uh, animations to be discrete now, but it's not that straightforward if you wanted to apply it everywhere. Nice. Good tip. So that is great for exit and entry animations, orchestrating the display property to flip at the right time. But there's also a new at rule that you need to establish where an animation should start and animate in from in scenarios where an element is being added to the DOM. And that is called starting style or at starting dash style. And these are styles for explicitly telling the browser what styling to start with when the element is added, which then it can transition to the normal styles of the resting place of the element. And you need starting style because we need a way to tell the browser what the styles of that element are, which haven't even been drawn to the DOM yet. So where it's animating in from, what the initial styles are that you're uh, going from, and the two state is the base styles of that element. So that's kind of what starting style does. It's the uh, pre-style stage. Yes, I think of it uh, like an animation lifespan of an element, like a character on a stage. You know, you have the enter stage, but it's like, what side of the stage are you entering from? And mm. starting style lets you say like, start from the right side of the stage or whatever they say. They, they, I think there's a nomenclature for that, like stage left, start on stage left and enter stage. And then when you're on stage, that's your resting position that you were talking about, like your natural state. And then there's exit stage. And then you say, which side of the stage do you exit to? So as starting style establishes where to begin when you're transitioning from not being in the stage to entering the stage. And uh, on stage is the resting state and exit is how it removes. So the syntax for this would be something like at starting dash style, open up your curly brackets. You'd write a selector, open up your curly brackets and write rule like opacity zero. It's also good to note this works with nesting. So you don't have to write that additional selector in there. You could just say like inside of your card style at starting style is opacity zero. And then its default style is opacity one. So then when anytime you add a card onto the stage, it would start at opacity zero because that's the starting style and transition itself to opacity one in a nice little clean declarative way. So what's new and why this is all important is because it's helpful with transitions and not keyframes. Remember keyframes can do most of this stuff if you hold its hand really tight, but this is transitions. And so much of this, uh, it needs to happen with dynamic transitions because, well, we're going to talk about we're setting display none and block on dialogues and popovers. We're appending them and removing them from the top layer. And we needed these new strategies for dealing with this. So these two new features we just described are for animating and well, transitioning to and from that top layer we keep talking about. 
It only took us, you know, 10 minutes to get here to sort of, <laughs> sort of like finally 20. Tee, up, tee up these uh, things. Are we at 20? Oh, yeah, we're at 20. Um, but, you know, I think it's worth it as we like lay out the problem space, uh, tell us what the tools are that we had, and then kind of go into what we have now to tackle these problems. Right. So I really like that stage analogy, by the way. That was a really good one where Thanks. you're entering from. I like that. Um, so... For example, if uh, you have transition behavior, it's critical and animating to and from the top layer because of what you're likely animating, and that is display. So consider how going in and out of this magical top layer is a lot like adding to the DOM and being removed from it. In this mindset, both starting style and transition behavior support the animated end result. They really work hand in hand. So starting style lets you specify how the popover or dialogue enter the stage um, slash top layer in this style, the pre-styles, while the transition behavior um, set to allow discrete allows the timing of the overlay or display transition animations uh, to switch properly from display none to display block and from those values. So there might be a new word that I just dropped there that was overlay. Uh, this one is special and we want to cover it. It's special because you can't style overlay. Uh, like we say in the display property, you could set that to um, flex or grid or whatever you want. There's not really an overlay property in CSS that you can set a value to. Instead, this is more like a keyword in the transition syntax that represents the state of an element being in or out of the top layer. It's an easy one to forget. It usually just relates to your exit animations. You might find that you're having a smooth entry animation if you have starting style and allow discrete. And if you don't have overlay being transitioned or animated, you might have uh, these exit animations that kind of just disappear. So that's when you'll notice it. Um, and you might need to add it depending on what you're animating, especially when you're animating things like backdrop. So just be aware for overlay. Nice. Yeah. So this, let's chat a little bit more about this mysterious overlay property because you're already kind of describing something that's exceptional, right? It has exceptions. Um, it's so like, uh, technically it does accept values. They're the values of none or auto. They just can't be set by us. So you can't write a style that's like overlay colon something. You just can't, it won't do it. This style is explicitly browser controlled. So don't go try to set it to anything because nothing's going to happen. And it's like, you shall not set overlay. Uh, but don't worry. I mean, it'll be set for you just in some. So, so it's like something you don't have to worry about. This property will be managed for you. And what if I do important in a layer? Will that override the user agent styles? <laughs> no way. User agent style. I mean, that's how layers work. They're going to win <laughs> up for what? Um, but this overlay property, that's funny. You could try, oh, maybe you could do a keyframe animation. You could try to do like some of those tricks that allow you to... We're like, how do we break Chrome? Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's try it. Let's try it after the show. We'll take 20 minutes to try to break the overlay property. But this overlay property, kind of like you was mentioning, it's only relevant when used within a list of transition properties and the transition behavior property is present. So it kind of takes this little mixture of styles and you have to be going in and out of the top layer for the overlay concept and the overlay transition behavior, you know, allowing a discrete flipping of this value in a transition to even be relevant. So it's a very specific and special use case property. So uh, know about it as you're going in and out of the top layer and you're trying to transition things. If you don't set transition behavior to allow discrete with overlay, it will always immediately change to none or hidden or auto or whatever it is. The browser is just going to flip it immediately. The immediacy doesn't leave time for transitions. And that's where allow discrete allows authors to de delay the flip to when it's convenient and matches their transition reveal or hide effects. So. A little bit about overlay there. All right. There's still more to talk about. And those are the hooks that you use to actually animate these things in. Um, you know, we mentioned at the top of the show that there's open and popover open. These are the pseudo elements or um, states attributes that you need to apply when you're styling the animation in. So I'll cover how to do this with dialog using the open attribute. And then Adam, you'll cover the popover with popover open. So for dialogues, when a dialogue is open, you have an open attribute that's toggled on the element in the DOM. This is sort of the hook that you use for starting style. And we can specify dialogues with the open attribute with a style that puts it off this stage, as I've described, uh, like with the opacity or transform. 
And that's just a starting style. So it'll transform from that initial style state specified into its base resting state, um, where it is when it enters. So in your style sheets for a dialogue entry animation, you'll want to do something like at starting style, and then this is an at rule, so you can have things inside of it. And then there you would do open, so like the open um, attribute. Or if you're also styling backdrop, you would do open colon colon backdrop, so the backdrop pseudo element on an open state and give that opacity zero because you're saying that this is my initial style that I'm animating in from. Then when you have opened it, you would set open, so like the open attribute, and then open colon colon backdrop for the backdrop and set that to opacity one. So outside of the starting style. Another thing that you can do is use nesting. So you can do open and then open backdrop and then have at starting style inside of there. I prefer this way because I like that it's all contained. Um, and so that's really all you need to animate it in from opacity zero to one, but you'll also want to animate the display. So that is something that you don't want it to be available in the DOM yet. You'll want to animate the display. And then the way that you do that is on the dialogue and then also on the backdrop. So dialogue and then the pseudo element for backdrop. You do transition, display, say 0 0.5 seconds, allow discrete, and then comma, overlay two for that backdrop, 0 0.5 seconds, allow discrete, and then comma, opacity, 0 0.5 seconds. And you don't need the allow discrete on that because it's not a discrete property. You could just have it directly know how to animate. So this will now complete the orchestration of styles to animate the dialogue element in and its backdrop. So we describe the starting style, that sort of default state, the natural state, and then specify the transition behavior uh, to allow discrete animations for display and overlay, Whew, which seemed like a lot of things. That was a lot. It took us 25 minutes to get to the, the part that people will probably care about. So if you're at this point hearing this, uh, we have links in the show notes. And so you can go find demos that have this all laid out for you. But yeah, you um, the same workflow that you just described works for popovers. So while that was a lot to go over, at least we're consistent here um, with the way that we're going to handle things. So we've got a starting style with popovers, an in state style, and a transition set with allow discrete so yeah, that's good news. You, want, you learn it once, you can kind of apply it and you're ready to transition other things like popovers. The main difference though is the selector used to hook into these things where dialogue used the open attribute, popovers get a pseudo class called colon popover dash open. So in your style sheet to uh, make a popover transitionable, you want styles like this at starting style, open up your curly brackets, colon popover dash open comma, colon popover open colon colon backdrop an opacity zero. So you can see this is very similar to what dialogues we're doing. We're just not using an attribute. Then we say colon popover open is opacity one. So when our popover is showing, we want its opacity to be one. And lastly, we need to set allow discrete on display and overlay so that these things don't immediately flip in the transition. We'll do that with um, an attribute selector of popover. So that's going to find our popover node. Then we're going to do comma, colon, colon, backdrop. So we're going to find the backdrops. And you could do popover backdrop there if you want it as well. And then just like in dialogue, we're going to set a transition property, colon, display space half a second with allow discrete, comma, overlay 0.5 seconds with allow discrete. And you can pass a, an easing function here if you want to. And then last, we want to specify transition opacity, comma, so it's opacity 0.5 seconds. And note how that like final style that sets transition behavior for a popover uses the attribute and not the pseudo class. And that's because popover open is only going to apply when it's open, not when it's closed and that's why we and we want allow discrete to apply to the display and overlay properties on hide and show so yeah this stuff is complex that's, that, that's a good note yeah or you could use a class whatever you call the popover and dialogue like you could you're probably going to end up doing that yeah that's true <laughs> so i know that sounds like a lot of work and moving parts and that's sort of because it is in order to implement this feature a lot of new things had to be added to the browser first the capability to animate something from display none to display block just in general the second is animating discrete properties so the other discrete properties the way to hook into that that's a new concept 
animating to and from the top layer. You know, we had something like dialogue way before popover, but it wasn't animatable. So making these things actually transition in a way that makes sense with display properties, that's a whole new concept too. And then in order to transition this, you have to know where you're transitioning from if it doesn't exist in the DOM tree yet. Like that is a whole lot of calculating rendering style that you need to prepare for and let the browser prepare for. So it's a lot, but it it's a lot of things to do to get this to work. Um, and I believe in you and just copy and paste. <laughs> yep. Steal our code. That's like, <laughs> open, <laughs> the end of this. Just open up the links, steal it and be like, OK, when I need to transition my dialogues or popovers, I know where to go. So, yeah, we're excited to see all these new features. And of course, we look forward to seeing the rad animations and transitions that you all give to your dialogues and popovers. Yes, I'm excited to see them become a little bit more smooth and interactive. So thank you for joining us today on this journey. Uh, we went through a bunch of detail on how to animate your dialogues and popovers. And we came up with the term the Dom penthouse, which is just <laughs> funny. I mean, like what what element wouldn't want to be in the Dom penthouse? You know, it just sounds... I'm into it. <laughs> All right. And y'all, if you have any questions about transitioning popovers and dialogues in and out of the top layer, Hit us up on Twitter or Mastodon or wherever you can find us. If we got your CSS questions. We love answering them. Just tweet us and we'll get your back. Yep. I'm Yuna. That's at U-N-A. I'm at Argyle Inc. A-R-G-Y-L-E-I-N-K. And your question could help more than just yourself. Yes. Also, if you liked this show, if you liked our previous show, if you want to support us in general, please just give us a little review. Take three minutes out of your day. Tell us what you liked about the show on whatever podcast app you're using, because those reviews, those ratings are how other people discover our show for it to pop up for them as well. Oh. And we appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, y'all. We'll see you around. Bye. Bye.